A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Hindu Newspaper Analysis brought to you by Shankara A's Academy for the day 22nd of March 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. See the first article that we have taken is an editorial article. This is about the virtual summit that was held yesterday. Uh, it was between India and Australia. So what we are going to do today, we are going to take this article as an opportunity and we are going to brush up the facts about India-Australia relationship in all aspects. See, in UPSC mains, many questions have been asked about India and its relationship with other countries. I have also given some of the examples of such questions in the main discussion. But now we will move on to the second article for today, which is about UN women. Fascinating, right? We have heard about UN General Assembly, UN Security Council. But what is this UN women? We will see. But now we are going to move on to the third article, which is about the economic crisis that is happening in Sri Lanka. So under this article discussion, we are going to see what are all the major factors that contributed to the crisis and uh, what are all the options that are uh, in front of Sri Lankan government to come out of it. And finally, uh, the fourth article is about the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We'll see some of the basic facts regarding IPCC from Prelim's point of view. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. Look at this editorial article here. This editorial talks about India-Australia relationship. See, this editorial states that Australia is celebrating India's 75 years of independence by making the largest single investment in India-Australia bilateral relationship. See, this editorial also talks about a long and special relationship between both countries. This particular article is in news because second India-Australia virtual summit was held yesterday that is on 21st March 2022. In this context, we will discuss about the significance of India-Australia relationship but first of all, we'll see the brief history of the relationship between the two countries and then we'll discuss about the second virtual summit which was held yesterday. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is given here for your reference. Please go through it. See, before we start our discussion, I want you to take a look at these questions here. The first question is asked in the year 2020. It was asked in GS paper 2. See, what is the question about? It is about Quad. Do you know who all constitute Quad? Yeah, you're right. Australia, Japan, India and US constitute Quad. So what is the question here? Quad is transforming itself into a trade block from a military alliance in the present times. Discuss. In order to answer such questions, you have to have a knowledge of the relationship that India has with the other three countries. That is the Japan, Australia and US. Right. You should know about the trade relations and the military alliance with these countries. Here in this discussion, we are going to see India-Australia relationship. So, this discussion will be useful if such a question is asked in the mains. Now, see this question here, which is asked in the year 2019. The time has come for India and Japan to build a strong contemporary relationship, one involving global and strategic partnership that will have a great significance for Asia and the world as a whole. Comment. See, I have given this question as an example here because in the year 2019, they asked about India-Japan relationship. But you never know. In the year 2022, they may ask about India-Australia relationship, right? You should always be prepared for such kind of questions. See, we have another similar question here, which was asked in the year 2018. India's relation with Israel have of late acquired a depth and diversity which cannot be rolled back. Discuss. See, like I said, in the year 2018, they have asked about India-Israel relations. Now, they may ask about India-Australia relations. So, the points that we are going to discuss today will be helpful if such a question is asked in the mains. So, with this awareness about the questions that are being asked in the mains, let's start our discussion. First of all, let's see the historical ties. See, the ties between India and Australia started immediately following the European settlement in Australia. Earlier, all trade was controlled by British East India Company through Kolkata. See, India-Australia established the diplomatic relations in the pre-independence period itself. And it is done with the establishment of India Trade Office in Sydney in the year 1941. 
See the end of the Cold War and the India's decision to launch major economic reforms in the year 1991 provided the first positive move towards the development of closer ties between the two nations. So this is the brief about the historical ties that we have with Australia. Now let's see what is the current status. See India Australia bilateral relationship was upgraded to a strategic partnership in the year 2009. But on June 4, 2020, in the first virtual summit, this strategic partnership was further elevated to a level of comprehensive strategic partnership, that is the CSP. See, in the year 2015, India and Australia agreed to hold the annual meetings of Foreign and Defence Secretaries 2 plus 2. This is done to enhance the foreign policy and security cooperation. This was also upgraded to a level of 2 plus 2 foreign and defense ministerial dialogue on September 11, 2021. So we had strategic partnership relationship with Australia in the year 2009 and it was elevated to comprehensive strategic partnership in the year 2020 and again in the year 2015 we had foreign and defense secretaries annual meetings and in the year 2021 it was upgraded to foreign and defense ministerial dialogue 2 plus 2 so this is the current status of india australia relationship see apart from this india and australia cooperate in various multilateral forums australia supports india's candidature in an expanded un security council both india and australia are the members of commonwealth asean regional forum asia pacific partnership on climate and clean development and they have also participated in the east asia summits see australia is an important player in asia pacific economic cooperation that is apec and it supports the india's membership of the organization another significant feature is the indian diaspora see the indian community in australia continues to grow in size and importance with the population of nearly 7 lakhs can you imagine it india is one of the top sources of skilled immigrants to australia There is also a constant flow of students and tourists from India. See the number of Indian students continue to grow with approximately 90,000 students presently studying in Australian universities. India is now the third largest source of immigrants to Australia after UK and New Zealand and the largest source of skilled professionals for Australia. See the growing significance of the community is reflected in the large scale celebration of Indian festivals in Australia especially Diwali and with these key information now let us move on to the India Australia virtual summit we have already discussed that first virtual summit was held on 4th june 2020 and yesterday that is on 21st march 2022 the second virtual summit was conducted in this summit the leaders of both the countries reviewed the multifaceted relationship between two countries and they exchanged views on regional and global developments prime minister modi expressed his satisfaction at the relationship which now covers diverse areas These areas include trade and investments, defense and security, education and innovation, science and technology, critical minerals, water management, new and renewable energy technology, COVID-19 related research etc. See Prime Minister Modi thanked Mr Scott Morrison for the special guest in returning 29 ancient artifacts to India. These artifacts comprise sculptures, paintings and photographs across centuries. Some of these artifacts dates back to 9th to 10th century from different parts of the india the artifacts include 12th century chola bronzes 11th to 12th century jain sculptures from rajasthan 12th to 13th century sandstone goddess mahishasura mardini from gujarat 18th to 19th century paintings and early gelatin silver photographs see both the leaders also appreciated the increasing strategic convergence between the two countries with the shared values and common interests which include a free open inclusive and prosperous indo-pacific prime minister modi also expressed his condolences on the destruction caused by severe flooding in new south wales and queensland and the resultant loss of lives and these are the key points you have to know about the india australia virtual summit see some of the key areas of convergence between the two countries are quad and the energy dialogues See the quadrilateral security dialogue is the informal strategic dialogue between India, USA, Japan and Australia. Quad was established with a shared objective to ensure and support a free, open and prosperous Indo-Pacific region. 
It strives to keep the Indo-Pacific free of any influence, especially free of influence by China. See, Quad is an opportunity for like-minded countries to share notes and collaborate on projects of mutual interest. The members share a vision of an open and free Indo-Pacific. See, each is involved in the development and economic projects as well as in promoting maritime domain awareness and maritime security. We know that Quad countries conducts Malabar naval exercise annually. And that's all about the Quad. And now regarding the energy dialogues, India and Australia have signed a letter of intent on new and renewable energy technology. See, it aimed at scaling up manufacturing and deployment of ultra-low-cost solar and clean hydrogen. See, energy transition was a major area of discussion in the dialogue. Both the countries spoke in detail about the ongoing energy transition activities in their respective countries with the focus on renewables, energy efficiency, storage, electronic vehicles, critical minerals, mining, etc. India and Australia also felt that there is an urgent need to focus on advancing technology and clean energy transition. These areas include energy efficiency technologies, grid management, R&D collaboration on flue gas desulfurization, biomass or hydrogen co-firing, water cycle optimization, renewables integration, batteries and electric mobility. And with this, we have come to the end of the discussion. We'll have a quick recap. What all we saw today? We saw about the historical ties between India and Australia. We saw that the diplomatic relations were established in the pre-independence period. And it is done with the establishment of India Trade Office in Sydney in 1941. And we saw that we moved from strategic partnership to comprehensive strategic partnership in the year 2020. Foreign and Defence Secretary annual meetings was upgraded to a level of Foreign and Defence Ministerial Dialogue in the year 2021. And we saw that Australia supports India's candidature in an expanded United Nations Security Council. It also supports India's membership in Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. And one another significant feature we saw is the Indian diaspora in Australia. We constitute the skilled immigrants to Australia, professionals and students in the Australian universities. India is the third largest source of immigrants to Australia after UK and New Zealand. And after that, we moved on to see about the first virtual summit. After that, we moved on to see about the second virtual summit that was held yesterday. We saw some points regarding it. And finally, we ended our conversation by seeing the convergent areas with regards to Quad and the energy dialogues. With these points in mind, let's move on to the next article discussion. See this news article here. It mentions that a network will be formed focusing on women. It will be called the International Network for Women in Cooperatives and this was announced in the ongoing United Nations 66th edition of the Commission on Status of Women or the CSW. So from prelims perspective, let us know some facts about this commission. See as the name suggests, it is for women. It is the principal global intergovernmental body that is exclusively dedicated to the promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women. It was established in 1946 by a resolution of UN Economic and Social Council and the CSW is the functional commission of the council. See the functional commissions are the subsidiary body of the Economic and Social Council. These are some facts about the commission. Now let us see how the UN Women is related to CSW. See as you know UN Women is the United Nations entity dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women. It was created in 2010, which is after 60 years of CSW. One of the main roles of UN Women is to support the intergovernmental bodies such as the Commission on Status of Women. They give support in their formation of policies, global standards and norms etc. So in this manner, UN Women functions as the Secretariat of CSW. So CSW works for promotion of women's rights. It documents the reality of women's lives throughout the world and it also shapes the global standards on gender equality and empowerment of women. Know that 45 member states of UN serve as the members of CSW at any one time and they are elected for a period of four years. Currently, India is also a member and its membership expires in 2025. Remember this, it is a fact because India is involved, right? So such a question may be asked in the prelims. See, in the year 1996, CSW took the leading role in monitoring and reviewing the progress and problems in the implementation of the 1995 Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. 
and it also took a leading role in mainstreaming a gender perspective in the UN activities. See here, the Beijing Declaration is a key global policy document on gender equality. See, the Commission has played roles in drafting many important global policies. It has contributed to the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It drafted the early international conventions on women's rights also. This includes the 1953 Convention on the Political Rights of Women. This convention was the first international law instrument to recognize and protect the political rights of women. It also drafted the 1957 Convention on the Nationality of Married Women and the 1962 Convention on the Consent to Marriage, Minimum Age for Marriage and Registration of Marriages. These were the first international agreements on the women's rights in marriage. More importantly, in the year 1979, it drafted a legally binding policy which is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and this convention requires countries to eliminate discrimination against women, girls in all areas, and promotes women's and girls' equal rights. So thus, this convention is often described as the International Bill of Rights for Women. CCSW also contributed in drafting ILO's 1951 convention concerning equal remuneration for men and women workers for work of equal value. See, this was the convention which enshrined the principle of equal pay for equal work. And that's all regarding this article. What all we saw? We saw about the Commission on Status of Women, which is a principal global intergovernmental body dedicated to the promotion of gender equality and empowerment of women, established in the year 1946 by a resolution of UN Economic and Social Council. And we saw about UN Women, which was created in the year 2010, 60 years after the establishment of CSW. Its role is to support intergovernmental bodies in their formulation of policies, global standards and norms. And we saw the important role played by the Commission in drafting of Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Convention on the Political Rights of Women, Convention on the Nationality of Married Women, and Convention on Consent to Marriage, Minimum Age for Marriage and Registration of Marriages, and Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Convention Concerning Equal Remuneration for Workers, both men and women, for the work of equal value. And with these key points in mind, let's move on to the next article discussion. Look at this article here. This article talks about the recent crisis in Sri Lanka. See, it also talks about the reason for the crisis and the present scenario in Sri Lanka and the assistance that is being offered by the Indian government. We'll see all these points in detail. But before that, the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. See, we all know Sri Lanka is in a state of economic turmoil, right? Economic turmoil means economic distress. So, let us see how bad the situation is right now. See, all the macroeconomic indicators are worrisome. For example, take a look at this graph here. This graph shows the exchange rate between the United States dollar and the Sri Lankan rupee. Two months ago, it was 193 Sri Lankan rupee per dollar. Then the SLR, which is the Sri Lankan rupee, started depreciating. Right now, the SLR is trading at 268 SLR per USD, that is the United States dollar. This is a huge fall and this is bound to make imports costly for Sri Lanka. Apart from this, inflation is also increasing rapidly. For that, take a look at this graph here. It shows the consumer price inflation rise. See, CPI which was hovering around 6% has raised to 15% in January 2022. By the end of February, it had reached to 16.8%. See, not just this. The foreign exchange reserves are also dwindling. See, the forex reserve of Sri Lanka stood at just 2.31 billion US dollars as of February 2022. In addition to this, Sri Lanka must repay the foreign debt totaling nearly $7 billion this year. Also, Sri Lanka must continue with the import of essential commodities like food, fuel and medicines with its meager reserves. See, all these worsening macroeconomic conditions means only one thing, which is the problems for the common people. Sri Lankan people have to wait in long lines for food and fuel and there is shortage of cooking gas, there are power cuts in various localities and patients are even finding it difficult to get their medicines. 
some people have even resorted to taking few meals cutting down milk for children or even going to bed hungry all these facts paint quite a picture doesn't it now let's see how did it start or where did it start and we'll also see when did the sri lankan economy start taking this downward dive and what are all the reasons for the present crisis see the main reason for the present crisis is covid-19 pandemic and its associated lockdown see the sri lankan economy heavily relies on three things for its foreign exchange earnings the first one is remittances from the gulf countries the second one is tourism and the last one is the earning from the export of tea and garments see all these sectors are heavily affected due to the pandemic sri lankan citizens working in the gulf countries lost their jobs and they had to come home due to the pandemic that resulted in loss in remittance earnings look at this graph here this graph shows the international tourist arrivals in sri lanka over the years you can clearly see that in the year 2020 there was a sharp fall in the arrival even after 2 years the tourism sector has only shown little signs of recovery this has affected the sri lankan economy pretty badly and this covers the tourism sector now let's see about the exports that is from tea estates and garment factories see during the pandemic to prevent the spread of the virus in clusters places where people work in close quarters like garment factories and tea estates faced severe lockdowns and this affected the sector largely see we have to ask ourselves this question can all the blame for the present crisis be put in covid-19 pandemic alone no the sri lankan government is also responsible for the situation see the sri lankan government lacked a comprehensive strategy to respond to the crisis first as in the august last year the sri lankan government started the emergency distribution of essential food items at the same time the sri lankan government made several restrictions on import of food to save its falling forex reserve the plan backfired people started hoarding food this further increased the inflation worsening the crisis and the next biggest blunder is sri lanka's ill advised switch to organic farming See when India faced a food crisis in the 60s we resorted to the green revolution although the green revolution solved the food crisis we are facing the after effects of green revolution like negative social and environmental impacts see while the green revolution is associated with its negative social impacts organic produce are associated with low form yields and higher prices that is Organic farms have low yields and higher cost compared to the conventional farms. See when the food security of a country is at stake, it is dangerous to turn to the decision into a binary choice of conventional or organic farming. This is like giving a choice, either this one or that one. But instead of this, the government should have encouraged organic farming while continuing with the conventional farms, which will provide a buffer. So as the Sri Lanka government banned the chemical fertilizers without preparing farmers it resulted in an increase in food prices and also led to the shortages of food supplies see these are the some of the reasons that led to the current crisis in Sri Lanka having seen the reasons for the current situation now let us see the options that are available for the Sri Lanka to manage the crisis in the short term The first is currency swaps agreement. What is a currency swap agreement? It is an arrangement between two friendly countries to involve in trading in their own local currencies. Here, both countries pay for import and export at predetermined rate of exchange without bringing in third country currency like the US dollar. For example, in this case the Indian government and the Sri Lankan government will sign an agreement saying that The exchange rate between the Indian rupee and the Sri Lankan rupee is fixed at 1 SLR is equal to 2 Indian rupee. Since USD is not involved and the exchange rate is predetermined, there is no need to worry about the exchange rate fluctuations. This will help Sri Lanka with its import of essential commodities. As of now, the Indian government has extended 400 million US dollars in currency swaps with Sri Lanka. See the next option that is in front of the Sri Lankan government is loan deferment. Now what is loan deferment? See it allows the Sri Lankan government to temporarily suspend making payments on the principal and the interest of the loans it has taken from India. In line with the Indian government's neighborhood first policy, 
the indian government has extended 500 million dollars in loan deferment to the sri lankan government and the next option is line of credit let's see what is line of credit see it is a soft loan with a very low interest rate few days ago india extended 1 billion usd line of credit to sri lanka to supply the essential commodities see here not just india china is also extending its supports to sri lanka if all the support fails then the sri lankan government can also turn to imf for help see all these are temporary solutions to address the economic crisis in short term in the long term sri lanka must build a resilient economy that is resistant to external shocks such as pandemic exchange rate fluctuations etc it must diversify its economy and it should also know that relying only on a few sectors could be problematic see being an island nation it can augment its fishing potential by exploring deep sea fishing see we all know sri lanka lies in an important trading route connecting the east and west right so it has the potential to develop a trans shipment port in the lines of singapore it must take measures to increase the productivity of agriculture before turning completely to organic farming the tourism sector will bounce back once the pandemic subsides so there's no problem in that sector but what can sri lankan government do here it can also take measures to promote its tourism potential further and apart from this the sri lankan citizens who returned from the gulf due to the pandemic must be reskilled and employment opportunities must be generated see all these measures cannot be taken in a short time it requires structural changes within the government policy making process and only with all these measures and the structural changes sri lankan economy will become immune to external shocks and with this we have come to the end we'll have a quick recap we saw that sri lankan economy is in crisis and we saw some of the macroeconomic indicators the first one is exchange rate between usd and sri lankan rupee see slr is trading at 268 slr per usd and after that we saw the consumer price inflation which has raised to 15 percentage in january and it had reached to 16.8 percentage in february the foreign exchange reserves stood at 2.3 billion us dollars as of february 2022 and after that we saw the reasons which is the pandemic which resulted in low forex reserves see we saw three reasons one is low remittance from the gulf countries low earning from the export of tea and garments and low income from the tourism sector and after that we saw some other reasons that led to falling of forex reserve and after that we saw one another reason that led to the crisis in sri lanka which is the switch to organic farming and after that we saw about some of the short term measures to manage the crisis we saw currency swaps agreement we saw loan deferment we saw line of credit currency swaps agreement is an arrangement between two friendly countries to involve in trading in their own local currencies loan deferment is temporarily suspending the loan payment line of credit is a soft loan with a very low interest rate and we finally ended our discussion by seeing some of the long term measures that are to be taken by the sri lankan government to overcome the crisis or to avoid the crisis altogether with these points in mind let's move on to the next article discussion look at this news article here see this article is with reference to the comment by the un chief antonio guterres yesterday he said that the world's major economies were allowing carbon pollution to increase when drastic cuts are needed he also criticized that the planet saving goal of capping global warming at 1.5 degree celsius is already on a life support in this context ipcc report becomes important so we'll learn about ipcc from prelims point of view see the ipcc is nothing but the intergovernmental panel on climate change it is the international body for assessing the science related to climate change see the ipcc was set up in 1988 by the world meteorological organization and the united nations environment program so wmo and unep it aims to provide the policy makers with regular assessments of the scientific basis of climate change its impact future risks and options for adaptation and mitigation see so it is headquartered in geneva switzerland 
See, IPCC assessments provide a scientific basis for the governments at all levels to develop climate-related policies. These assessments underlie negotiations at the UN Climate Conference. See, the assessments are policy relevant but not policy prescriptive. So, what does this mean? That is, they may present projections of future climate change based on the different scenarios and the risks that the climate change poses and discuss the implications of response options. But they do not tell the policy makers what actions to take. Hence, the assessments are policy relevant but not policy prescriptive. See, the IPCC is an organization of governments that are the members of the United Nations or World Meteorological Organization. IPCC currently has 195 members. India is also one of the members. Here we have to know this only, whether India is a member or not. See, thousands of people from all over the world contribute to the work of the IPCC. For the assessment reports, experts volunteer their time as IPCC authors. They assess the thousands of the scientific papers published each year to provide a comprehensive summary of what is known about the drivers of climate change, its impacts and future risks and how the adaptation and mitigation can reduce those risks. An open and transparent review by the experts and government around the world is an essential part of the IPCC process. So it ensures an objective and complete assessment and reflects a diverse range of views and expertise. Through its assessments, the IPCC identifies the strength of the scientific agreement in different areas and indicates where further research is needed. An important point to be noted here is that the IPCC does not conduct its own research. So, it only does assessments. See, as a part of its assessment report, IPCC has published the second part of the sixth assessment report recently. Totally, it consists of three Parts, the AR6 report, that is the 6th assessment report, stated that the global warming is expected to hit 1.5 degrees Celsius in the early 2030s itself. It also stated that without reaching net zero carbon dioxide emissions, along with the strong reductions in other greenhouse gases, the climate system will continue to warm. IPCC for the 6th assessment report are divided into three working groups. They are Working Group 1 which involves the physical science basis, working group 2, which involves the impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, working group 3, which involves the mitigation of climate change. See, the sixth assessment cycle has also included shorter special reports on three topics. See, this you have to remember. The special reports include global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, climate change and land the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. So, these are all the three short special reports. And that's all regarding this article. So, what all we saw? We saw about the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It is an international body for assessing the science related to climate change. It was set up by World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environmental Program in the year 1988. See, the assessments of IPCC provide a scientific basis for the government at all levels to develop climate-related policies and the members of the organization are from United Nations and the World Meteorological Organization. It has currently 195 members. For the reports, experts volunteer their time as IPCC authors. And after that, we saw about the assessment report, 6th assessment report. To be precise, second part of the 6th assessment report, we saw it consists of three parts, working group 1, 2, 3, which consists of physical science basis, impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability, mitigation of climate change respectively. And after that, we saw three shorter special reports, namely global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius, climate change and land, the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. With these points in mind, let's move on to the next part of our discussion, that is the practice prelims question discussion. See, we have three questions today. We'll solve them one by one. The first question is, UN Women was formed by merging which of the following entities? International Research and Training Institute for the Advancement of Women, Office of the Special Advisor on Gender Issues and Advancement of Women, United Nations Development Fund for Women, Commission on Status of Women. See, before solving this question, we'll see some of the facts. See, UN Women is the United Nations entity dedicated to gender equality and the empowerment of women. It was established to accelerate the progress on meeting the needs of women and girls worldwide. 
It supports the UN member states as they get global standards for achieving gender equality and works with the governments and civil society to design laws, policies and programs and services needed to ensure that the standards are effectively implemented and they truly benefit women and girls worldwide. See this we saw in our discussion itself. Apart from this, UN Women also coordinates and promotes the UN system's work in advancing gender equality and in all deliberations and agreements linked to the 2030 agenda. As we already saw, it was created only in 2010 when the United Nations faced serious challenges in its efforts to promote gender equality globally. You should know that it was created by merging four previously distinct parts of the UN system which focused exclusively on gender equality and women's empowerment. They are Division for the Advancement of Women, International Research and Training Institute for the Advancement of Women, Office of the Special Advisor on Gender Issues and Advancement of Women, United Nations Development Fund for Women. So these are all the four entities that are merged to form the UN Women. So from this information we know that statement 1, 2, 3 they are correct because by merging these entities only UN Women was formed. Now take the fourth statement which is the Commission on Status of Women. See Commission on Status of Women is still a separate entity and its secretariat is UN Women. So CSW's secretariat is UN Women. So we found out that statement 1, 2, 3 are right and 4 is wrong. So the correct option will be option C 1, 2 and 3. See this question here, it is a map based question. Arrange the following places in Sri Lanka from east to west. Point Pedro, Trincomalee, Hambantota, Colombo. To solve this question, see this map here. So what we are going to do here is we are going to locate the places that are given in these statements. See of the all places that are given, the Trincomalee is in the easternmost part of Sri Lanka. See it is here and after that Hambantota and after that Point Pedro and finally Colombo. So what is the correct order? It is 2, 3, 1 and 4. So the correct option here will be option B, 2, 3, 1 and 4. See, Trincomalee is in news. See, it is in news because India is developing a strategic oil tank form project in Trincomalee and the NTPC recently went into agreement with the Ceylon Electricity Board to set up a solar power plant in Sampur. Sampur is located in Trincomalee district. Take a note of this point also. Now moving on to the final question, see it is a very simple question and this is the quiz question for you. I will read out the question, which of the following about IPCC is or are correct? It was set up by World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. Option B, it is headquartered in Hague, Netherlands. Option C, India is not a member of IPCC. Option D, IPCC has been funded by the governments to conduct its own research. See, it is very simple. Try to recall our discussion. Attempt this question and post your answer in the comment section. I have given a mains question for your practice. So, interested aspirants, write it and post it in the comment section. If you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And with this, we have come to the end. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment. And do subscribe to Shankar A's Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you. Thank you.